How do we overcome the conflicts at the heart of our society and in ourselves? Welcome to The Hub for Important Ideas. I'm Steve James. And I'm Ken Swain. In this episode, we discuss conflicts, both in our society and within ourselves. From the way we cope with our individual anxieties to our society's militarization and attempts to dominate the world. We're going to share with you part two of an interview we did with Dr. Kirby Farrell a number of years ago. Kirby is a professor of English at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, the author of a number of books, including Post-Traumatic Culture. He was a regular contributor to Psychology Today Online. He is also a jazz pianist and a composer. Here's the interview with Dr. Farrell. Welcome, Dr. Farrell. Delighted to be here. Great. I know we asked you this last time, Kirby, but uh, could you re- you mind going over this again? W- what is thinking the unthinkable? Well, that's a term I would use to talk about the way in which we need to understand all of the awareness that we exclude from everyday life. Most of us live in a magical circle of habit, routine, rules, regulations that seem to protect us from unexpected and unwanted catastrophes and surprises. Ultimately, Ernest Becker would say, from from death and the fear of death, which is almost as terrifying as the real thing. So when in order to stay inside that magic circle, we have to screen out a lot of things that we're aware of, but really make life much more complex and take a kind of courage and concentration and energy that we sometimes can't manage as individuals and also as a whole culture. So our job as citizens and my job as a critic is to try to see what is it that we're not thinking about that could help us cope with the world and understand and be happier with ourselves. Think the unthinkable. Think the unthinkable. Now, you've spoken in the past about the inescapable conflicts that define us as humans. How does that work in all this? Well, I mean, one of the problems is that on the one hand, we're animals like all the other animals. We have much of our, many of our genes in common with our primate cousins, which is to say we live by hunting, killing, butchering, chewing, eating, and then expelling a shameful waste living things, <laughs> right? Um, you know, you look at a, at a slaughterhouse and you're looking at one side of human experience. On the other hand, we're symbolic animals, unlike the squirrels and the chickens who don't worry about what names to call each other and maps to find hidden nuts. And we envision, we can envision various kinds of perfection and beauty and symbolic dimensions to experience that make us quite unique in the world. Unfortunately, that uniqueness includes not only a sense of, of beauty and purpose and meaning, but also an awareness that we die, that we are limited, that we can see contradictions and ironies and catastrophic uh, failures of meaning in the world that would be overwhelming or terrifying if we didn't protect ourselves uh, and find some way of coping with them. That's the job of culture, is to try to find and to perpetuate systems of meaning, systems of symbols that make us feel at home, that make life purposeful, that seem to protect us from the chaos of experience. Think of it this way. I mean, our Victorian great-grandparents following Darwin, discovered the side of human experience that I just described to you, that we do have this animal inheritance. And from one point of view, I mean, the Victorians initially thought, aha, the law of of development, the law of nature is the law of the jungle. It's dog eat dog. Today, in some practical sense of the word, that would be the law of radical free market competition. You know, it's survive and excel or die, basically. This is often mistakenly referred to in public discourse as conservatism. But in fact, the old style of conservatism was about trying to preserve what was valuable and meaningful, and that meant social relationships and bonds. So I would say this new free market ideology isn't conservative at all. It's actually rather radical in historical terms. Liberals, on the other hand, a term which is now so confused that it's almost yeah. meaningless, 
actually pick up historically on the other side of Darwinism. Because what Darwin actually saw was that the animals sometimes are hunting and killing and eating one another, but some animals survive, some life forms survive in the world by cooperation. And their success is entirely based on symbiotic, you know, helping one another and thinking as communities. I think liberals tend toward this interpretation. It may be that we need to do justice to nature by having both possibilities, you know, in our thinking. But the fact is, today, the terminology is insanely incoherent. And when you listen to the news, it's enough to give you a headache because it's so baffling and so historically simply mistaken. Kirby, you've said that the post-World War II compact or social contract has broken down, is just gone. Uh, what was that originally and how has it changed? Well, World War II gave Americans a sense of being the world's heroic rescuers, using military force to restore law and order and, as it were, love and appreciation to a world that had gone catastrophically mad. Tom Engelhart, in a book called The End of Victory Culture, says that this story served Americans from 1945 on up through Vietnam. It made us feel good about ourselves. In Becker's terms, it was a kind of heroic immortality. We had done something that defined us in a lasting way as perpetually uh, useful, good, wholesome citizens of, of the planet. And what the, complicates this is that the war also inadvertently left us economically more powerful than any country. This has turned out to produce a, you know, an American dollar, which is now wildly overvalued and implicated in dangerous cycles of uh, boom and bust economics. We now are the most indebted nation on earth. And what is it, 41% of our foreign debt is now owned by China, for example, which is the manufacturing powerhouse that America was 50 years ago. So that's a dimension that's radically changed. The other dimension is that it produced, World War II produced the military industrial state. And we now produce far and away more weapons than any other nation on earth, many, many more times than the next nearest competitor. We sell more weapons to countries than any other country on earth. We are the merchant, as it were. Um, this mentality and, and investment and infrastructure and all of the roles and apparatus that went with it eventually became the corporatized military of the Vietnam era. Gabriel and Savage, two sociologists, wrote a book called Crisis in Command, in which they point out that the American army actually fell apart in Vietnam because it had been turned into a kind of corporate structure. And after the defeat, when everybody was terribly demoralized, uh, so much you know, genuine goodwill and, and ambition and sacrifice had come to naught. In the effort to re-understand that, the military became more technological, as it were, more remote controlled. We now talk about smart bombs, and we try to make it less personal. But of course, what this also means is that it's less controllable by the feelings of individual participants. It can be controlled from a great distance. The military has been rehabilitated. This was Ronald Reagan's great project. But it's not clear to me that we necessarily understand how the limitations of the military industrial world ought to affect our foreign policy. And so we find ourselves now in the middle of a, of a apparently endless war on terror. And that terror is pretty much related to the fact that we are so militarized, we become an inviting target for other people. What, American soldiers are in 110 countries around the world. This is what the terrorists said as what Osama bin Laden said, was provoking him to attack America. But let me understand what you're saying. We're still wrestling with that post-World War II vision of mm -hmm. ourselves, our, our identity. In other words, mm -hmm. it's the identity is in conflict with the reality. Is yeah, it? that's a good way of putting it, Steve. I mean, when you implicitly what you're saying is that the, the fashionable way of putting this is to say that we now think of ourselves as the world's policemen. This was unprecedented in American history. The original idea is that we were going to be a nation of independent citizens who would mind our own business and be you know, good neighbors to the rest of the world. When you make yourself the world's 
policemen and you put your troops in the Middle East, which is what happened in 1990, you're going to necessarily arouse tremendous resentments locally. And we've had troops in Saudi Arabia since the first Gulf War, and that is the proximate cause for the outrage of the Islamic terrorists in 9-11. This doesn't get talked about very often, but I can see no way of getting around this as a fundamental cause and effect relationship. So these are very complex issues, but I think the point, our point, Becker's point, would be that things happen as systems in life. You very rarely find a pure villain. You know, if you work in prisons, you almost never hear anybody say, well, you know, I was a villain. I was really just bad. Everybody thinks they're doing the right thing, including us. But in fact, behavior is much more complex than that. So what does the end of this uh, victory culture imply for us now, especially in the wake of the 9-11 attitude? Well, I love Tom Englehart's term. He says, look, we're suffering from storylessness. And if you think about it, I mean, Hollywood movies, what are they? Endless, violent melodramas in which you, you fantasize about antisocial impulses and then hammer them down, right? Everything is retro in American culture, you know? Son of... <laughs> Son of the big sequel, movie where yeah. stuff blew up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Beautifully put. That's not a bad idea. Yes. <laughs> write that down. Um, you know, if things are going to be retro like this, it, it's a sign that we're anxious about finding new ways of understanding who we are and where we're going. In post-traumatic culture, I was arguing that almost all the problems we face now and the solutions were perfectly obvious in 1890. Well, what did Vietnam do to our culture? Well, that's a, that's a complicated question. My sense would be that what emerged from Vietnam was a, a very complexly self-deceiving reaction to defeat. I mean, before the war began, or in the early days of the war, when people started to say, is this worth it? No, someone no less than Ronald Reagan himself was talking about invading the country, turning it into a parking lot, and being home by Christmas. That's a paraphrase of a quote. That's a fantasy of extermination. These people were farmers. They weren't any threat to us. And the devastation, the killing, the, the, the scale of the slaughter was shameful. We never really came to terms with this problem. Yeah, there was this depression, this feeling of we lost. Well, the, but it, the, the term post-traumatic right. is associated with those returning veterans who did suffer. I mean, it's terrifying to go into a war like that and suffer physically and mentally and then have grave misgivings about the, the honorable nature of the act you undertook. But in terms of our culture today, I mean, mm. where do we find ourselves now in this, this post-Vietnam? Well, one thing I think you can say is that we have compensated, in part brilliantly, I mean, they're not kidding when they say they have the world's most industrialized and technologically sophisticated military. So we have, I mean, it's as if we had, we caught a cold, and the reaction of the body has been this ferocious production of antibodies. And now we're talking about militarizing space and preemptively attacking countries if we have a suspicion they might be hostile to us. So there is a need for a kind of philosophy and a kind of understanding that is as yet only beginning to come to the surface. Part of this is obviously a reaction to the suffering of 9-11, of which was indeed catastrophic for many, many people. You know, a lot of the, the fear, the grief, the loss of confidence in the future was palpable, and there's no way of minimizing that. But as with catastrophes going back to the beginnings of human history, the heroic survival means finding ways of forgiving your enemies, forgiving yourself, and understanding where you are realistically in order to prevent further aggression and further terror. And so my, my inclination would be to say, let's look around for leadership that's trying to calm a really terrified and aggressively aroused population. You know, let's look around for leadership that can make us feel heroic for trying to understand who we think might be our enemies. Kirby, how has our view of heroism changed? It seems to me it's becoming highly theatrical, you know, and also in a strange way robotic. 
you know, if you think about it, a lot of the military language and metaphors and imagery you're seeing is actually celebrating the machinery, the tools, the, uh, the weapons, more than the character. More than the purpose. More than the purpose. More than the individual courageous human being that has to go out there and run the risk of giving up life for an abstract but important purpose, whether it's family or country or... We invented all these amazing weapons and now we need a reason to use them and show you what they can do. Well, that's one possibility that would go with it. The, I would think that in some senses the world becomes more threatening by the decade because of things that are on the edge of human control. I mean, nuclear weapons, indebtedness, overpopulation the struggle over fundamentalism versus modernism around the world in this the country. scarcity of, of food and water. Yes, and absolutely. Land. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, as you know, one argument for the struggles in the Middle East, and hence one argument over the terrorism in Manhattan, is the, the very real likelihood of energy shortages over the next you know, few decades. The Hubbard's Peak argument, based on the geologist uh, Hubbard, argues that, in fact, we're probably in this decade seeing the peak of world hydrocarbon production. So from this point of view, it could be perfectly understandable if folks around the world thought, well, you know, the Americans are being predatory. They're trying to get their hands on the one reservoir of, that still has major production possibility uh, in the world. Because after all, Energy is like food in the modern world. It powers industry, and it, it gives us the vitality that has freed up leisure time and therefore freed up this fantastic production of gorgeous cultural richness over the last 150 years. Uh, Washington talks about stabilizing the world, and uh, Becker talks about humans as animals in competition for survival. How does Becker's view help us to understand the current events we're talking about here? Well, if you recall, what Becker is insisting on is that we're inherently conflicted. There isn't any way of making the conflicts disappear. What you can do, and this is what Freud said, is try to understand that you're trapped in conflict, in which case, suddenly, heroism and value are not so much the heroic strutting of a hero in a white hat but in fact, what, an admiration of grace and beauty and communication and empathy, the ability to see how other people must be feeling and thinking, and therefore to try to find language that can bring them into some common shared experience with you. Emotional intelligence. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a lovely phrase. Yeah. That's a lovely phrase for it. So in that sense, I mean, we're talking about a very basic operation of raising a generation to understand and appreciate, and literally appreciate, to love the need to communicate, the need to be able to share the heart as well as the greed for life, to disarm the danger with other people. But why are we in such a, why is this such a dangerous time historically? It just seems like we're, we're on some kind of a, a precipice. Yeah. Well, don't you feel that this has to do with the scale of life in modernism? World population now is massive in a way that's unimaginable to previous generations. Uh, we've got nuclear weapons. This was not a problem, uh, you know, in the Revolutionary War. Suitcase nuclear weapons, bioterrorism. We, you know, we're finding that people get frightened and they start recreating their cultures in very narrow, mechanical, rigid ways. I mean, we think of this as sort of cult religion or fundamentalist religion in some of its forms around the world, but it doesn't have to be religious. I mean, it's basically narrowing down the range of things we're free to think about and therefore to cooperate over. And it's partly because of the world. We know so much. We're overwhelmed. And now we're introducing this new ideology of preemptive war. I mean, we'll, we will now attack on the the possibility, the supposition that they, might attack. They, that they might attack. This new ideology means we could be literally attacking anyone at any time and be at war forever. Don't How you do we understand this 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 conflict that we? Yeah, I mean, don't you feel that this is fundamentally an, an anti psychological way of looking at the world? In the sense that, I mean, if you you wouldn't walk into a group of strangers 
and tell someone at the door, well, by the way, I do have a gun. And if I suspect that any of you don't like me, I'll kill you. Because, you know, instinctively you would know that this would cause hysterical suspicion and rage in the people you're with. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, certainly you wouldn't go anywhere near the bar with, you know, with that mentality. So I would say that this is, you know, that that's a, an ideology that it completely ignores the emotional and uh, structure of motive and, and hopes and fears and aggression that make people work. The only way you can avoid that kind of hysterical uh, aggression in people is to try to literally bring them into some kind of dialogue. I thought it was quite terrifying that the American incursion into Iraq was virtually a solo mission because you always need the other folks on the planet to be reinforcing your sense or helping you test what is real, how sane, how practical, how flexible, how creative, how productive for the future is this particular action going to be? Alone, by yourself, yeah. you, you might as well be locked in a padded room. How does Becker define insanity, and how does that definition relate to our current historical moment? Well, as I recall, he associates insanity with a kind of obsessive rigidity. And if you start thinking of that as a metaphor, it starts to move in the direction of industry and technology and machinery and robots and being out of control. So you can see why these wonderful inventions, I mean, which are fa who would have thought that the human animal, which, what, 50,000 years ago was living in caves in Europe, would be sitting behind a, a computer console with little buttons dispatching gorgeous cigar-shaped missiles, uh, you know, a few thousand miles to annihilate enemies. But it seems like we've got all this incredible technology and we're still dealing with these old ideas. These, where are the new ideas? Where's the? Why don't we have the creativity to come up with the new ideas for this new era? Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a really powerful question, isn't it? I mean, doesn't that immediately make you want to ask, well, wait a minute, what's happening in our families? What's happened? I mean, what are mom and dad and the kids doing after supper in an American family that could be but may not be introducing them to their own creative resources? What's happening in the schools? You know, what are the schools free to talk about? What happens when people do think up new ideas in America? Do, are the, They're marginalized. Well, yeah. I mean, are the ideas welcomed or, in fact, do they immediately become commercial properties or non-commercial and therefore irrelevant? These are all functions of where we are as a profoundly contradictory society. I mean, you could argue, I think, that the sanest kind of politics in America would be using as its fundamental core belief the need to create a play space where new ideas for harmonizing and alleviating uh, homicidal rage could be explored and brought into some kind of living, productive, wholesome fruition. And that will be yeah. the subject for part three. We need a play space. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, our guest has been Dr. Kirby Farrell of UMass Anhurst. Kirby, thank you for another thoroughly engaging conversation. My pleasure. and Delightful thank you. Thank to, you, to be with you. Thank um, you. You've been listening to an interview with Kirby Farrell talking about conflicts in ourselves and our society. Ken, what grabs you in this interview? Well, I want to talk about Kirby's magic circle. Okay. He first mentioned the magic circle in response to your asking him about what it means to think the unthinkable. And he pointed out that being a human being is problematic. Our self-awareness creates problems for us as animals, as finite creatures, and so to avoid constant discomfort and distraction, we ignore large parts of reality. We don't get all bogged down in a lot of heavy stuff like mortality and death and dying, and we focus instead on things more immediately practical and fulfilling. We do this as individuals, and perhaps more pertinent to the present discussion, we do it collectively in groups. And in order to do that, we have to all come to certain agreements. Right. And a huge number of these agreements are instilled in us as children, before we are aware enough to know what's happening to us. We learn all the basic things that, taken collectively, can be called our culture. We also learn that there are certain things that it's not okay to talk about. Well, it's the socialization process, to give it a name. 
Yep. And you're right. What isn't talked about is often more important than what's discussed out loud. Yes. And children are great at reminding us about this, right? Children are naturally curious and they don't yet know that it isn't okay to ask certain questions. But we teach them quickly and they learn that life just goes much smoother when you follow the rules of social etiquette. Well, as the saying goes, learn how to be a good guest and you'll always get invited back. I learned that one too. So back to Kirby's Magic Circle, because I've been thinking a lot about it in light of uh, current events. And it took a while to admit it to myself, but I live in that circle as much as anybody. And I like it. There are very few surprises. I do the same things in the same way every day, and they yield the same result each time, usually a result I enjoy, or at least I don't hate. And I find life is less stressful and more manageable. What could be wrong with that? Ah, yes. But in the modern world, it takes an ever more complex social machinery to make that magic circle possible. Our grandparents saw the advent of the electric light and indoor plumbing, and if they flipped the switch on the wall and the light came on, all was right with their world. Uh, I'm sure they had other terrors. Modernity itself must have been pretty unsettling. Well, that's probably true, but we have to worry about data speed and the compatibility of a driver or the thing will run slow or not at all. And without connectivity, well, things could really... And computer crashes. Shudder at the thought. We might have to actually talk to each other in person. No, reboot it. It's got to work. It's got to work. So many things are taken for granted now that we pay no attention to them at all. Things like laws and rules and roads and sports and cars, and they're all just there. We count on them without even giving the matter much thought. Ah, but then something goes very, very wrong. A virus that's killing people, and the medical system that fixes our every problem suddenly doesn't know quite what to do. And then... And the police kill unarmed African Americans, and... Yes. Everybody freaks out. And the police is one of those things we count on without thinking much about. If you're white, you don't tend to think about it. it right. It turns out... That, that is a great luxury, a reliable police force. That may be part of our magic circle, but not necessarily for our minority populations. No, not so much. But I, I think I see where you're going. The magic circle is now broken. Well, that's a scary thought, right? Yep. Broken by the pandemic, which has rewritten what's normal, and the, the violent police response to the protests that threaten our peace. So what we're calling a magic circle is a refuge that doesn't seem to be working very well, and there are a lot of inherent problems. It's a troubling time indeed. Steve, what were some of your takeaways from that? I like what Kirby said about our society's division and the way we think about nature. Yeah. I think that was a really interesting and insightful idea of his. He says that the conservative mindset looks at the law of the jungle, a dog-eat-dog -dog world that's embodied in what we call free market competition, right. which, of course, isn't really free. Yep. He compares it to the liberal, whatever liberal means, the liberal notion of survival by cooperation, right? by symbiosis, thinking as a community. Yeah. Both are Darwinian concepts. He suggests both sides have to give justice to nature. I love that. Very interesting phrase. What else hit you? He talked a lot about our post-World War II victory culture that defined us as perpetually useful and wholesome and economically successful, and how we wrestle with it as our national identity. This image of ourselves as the world's policemen is in conflict with reality. And he brought up one of Ernest Becker's most compelling ideas— that being that much of the evil in the world is done by people who are trying to do good. It's a very powerful idea, and it bears repeating, and it's certainly applicable to what he's talking about. Here we are in post-World War II victory culture, thinking we're doing right for ourselves and the world by being the world's cops. When in fact, many parts of the world look at us as greedy, domineering bullies. 
And this whole concept of people doing evil, when they're trying to rid the world of evil, well, that's from Escape from Evil by Ernest Becker. Yep. Jerry Piven talked about it in episode five. You can listen to that if you missed it. That's a very unsettling idea. Oh, absolutely. It's a very important idea. Kirby also talked about Becker's definition of insanity as obsessive rigidity, which I think is a very important idea in this divided, rigid society we're in right now. Yeah. We seem to be in a very rigid, almost insane time. Yes. With what Kirby called inescapable conflicts that define us. Maybe what we called tribalism last episode could be called rigid parts of our society. Yes, it's polarized also. Yes. Kirby emphasized the military in all this. He called it the corporatized military. Post-Vietnam military became more technically sophisticated and rehabilitated after our defeat over there. Yeah. He talked about post-traumatic stress in the soldiers. Yeah. But in his writing, he talks about post-traumatic stress that maybe the whole country was suffering from PTSD after the defeat in Vietnam. That's an interesting idea. And I think of the U.S. as a militarized society. We've been at war since before the nation was founded in 1776. If you Google U.S. wars or look it up in Wikipedia, you see a list of 125 declared wars, quasi-wars, wars against Native Americans for generations, domestic armed conflicts and rebellions, invasions of other countries, and a whole variety of military incursions and adventures that involved armed conflict. One after another after another, war has been our default mode from the beginning. Wow. Yeah, every generation. It's no wonder that our inclination when there are protesters in the streets is to treat them like our enemies and bring in military-style police and actual soldiers to do battle with our own civilians. We're certainly doing that. Look at Memorial Day, one of our most sacred holidays dedicated to our military. Seven states also celebrate Confederate Memorial Day in April. And Texas also observes Confederate Heroes Day. Alabama and Mississippi combine Robert E. Lee Day with Martin Luther King Day in January. Yikes. I'm amazed by that one, trying to put those two together in your mind. Arkansas used to have their own Robert E. Lee Day in January, but they moved it to October. I wonder why. Virginia celebrates Robert E. Lee Stonewall Jackson Day on the Friday before Martin Luther King Day. Unbelievable. The gross insensitivity of these holidays. Think about people who are taking down statues and Confederate flags. And on the most sacred day of the year for African Americans, people are celebrating Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. It's mind-boggling. But we digress. That's one part of this. But the other part is they're honoring war. Right. They're honoring people who killed hundreds of thousands of Americans. Yep. The worst traitors in the history of our country who, by the way, never suffered for their crimes of rebellion and insurrection. They pretty much just went home, didn't they? Pretty much. So here you've got a nation today that wants to put Julian Assange on trial and give him possibly Cap- capital punishment. Put him, yeah, put him to death for being a journalist. Right. Right? But Robert E. Lee, he didn't get hanged or shot. He just went home. I'm sorry, I'm digressing. That's all right. So this is all about war, about killing and dying in armed conflict. It's very possible that Kirby's notion of PTSD in a society could very well apply to the South. In their culture, there is still PTSD underneath. It's the result of the shame and guilt and the undermining of their identity. Yeah. That they were defeated and occupied the only part of America that was ever occupied by an invading army. Yeah, America lost in Vietnam, but basically 
we didn't win the war. We walked away. Right. The Vietnamese didn't come and occupy the U.S. and occupy Washington. Yeah. Americans went home in shame, but didn't suffer what the South suffered after the Civil War, the war between the states. Right. And that trauma, I would maintain, is still in their culture. Yeah. And the shame and guilt are still there, buried yeah. beneath the surface. They're not conscious of it, right. but it motivates their actions. Another thing Kirby points out is that high-tech warfare is it's less personal. It's less human. For some reason, I don't know what, why it was coming into my mind, but it, it reminds me of the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. Uh, yeah, you've seen that. I, I don't know if our listeners have seen it. It's, you know... Yeah, probably most of our listeners have seen that movie. So I think that most of our listeners are probably about our age. Maybe. Well, if they were our age, they were probably stoned when they saw it. <laughs> uh, I'm sure the new generation saw it stoned, too. But anyway, in this movie, you have these prehistoric proto-humans who discover the first tool, a thigh bone. And what do they do with it? They use it as a weapon to kill and gain control of a competing tribe. The first tool in history was a lethal weapon. Right. Then the movie fast forwards to 2001 AD, and we have spaceships. And potentially the most deadly invention of all, artificial intelligence. Right. How the computer is the most ruthless killer imaginable. Our future beckons. Indeed it does. Our internal conflicts define us as humans, and our society reflects the conflicts inherent in us. What an amazing concept. Kirby talked about heroism, and I love it when Kirby gets hopeful because he gets poetic. Yeah, he does. And he talks about heroism as an admiration of grace, beauty, communication, empathy, the ability to see how other people must be thinking and feeling, a finding language to bring people to some kind of shared experience. Isn't that beautiful? That's a wonderful, wonderful idea. I love that. Almost like we need to raise a new generation to understand and appreciate the need to communicate, the need to be able to share the heart as well as the greed for life to disarm the danger with other people. Wow. I really, really like that. Isn't that great? Share the heart as well as the greed for life. Beautiful. So join us next time. Like us on Facebook. Please recommend us to your friends. You can find us at www.thehubforimportantideas.com. Subscribe on your favorite platform. And support us on Patreon. We are 100% listener supported. Thank you for listening to The Hub for Important Ideas. I'm Steve James. And I'm Ken Swain. Stay safe, everybody. Stay well. Stay well.